So let's go right into our lesson for today. Does everybody remember what we just covered uh, during the reading? We read two readings, okay? We read first uh, the small portion of Esot HaBracha, which probably I'm just going to cover just a few things. And we cover the special reading for this Shabbat, Shabbat Kol Hamoed, found in Exodus, uh, I believe, 33, right? 33. Let me get into my PC here so I can follow you. Okay. I need to dismiss the children, don't I? I see mothers taking off. I forgot that. I was trying to go so fast. Are there still some children or they left? Because they're coming back in at the end, so I'm not going to worry. They'll get the blessing at the end. <laughs> okay. We're just trying to get caught up here. Okay, so if you're following Shabbat Kol Hamoed, we talked a little bit when we started uh, today. So if you go to your Tanakhs, it goes to Exodus through Exodus 34, 26. And there is the Haftarah of Ezekiel 38. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in there. But traditionally, uh, since Sukkot has multiple days, it comes with multiple readings. Yom Rishon, which is basically the first day they read the instruction found in Vaikra or Leviticus 22 through 2344, in which the instruction is given to observe this Moed, okay? Then Yom Sheni, which is the second day, that include the Haftarah of 1 Kings 8 through to 21. So the third through the fifth day, they finish reading uh, Vaikra 23. And day six, they put this uh, Numbers 29 reference there as the Maftir for the day. Day seven, Zechariah 14. What day is today? Very good, good. <laughs> we started when? What day? Sunday? Okay. So we are going this evening into day seven and then we finish the next day. Okay. So Shabbat Kol Hamoed, which is what we're covering today, Exodus 33 and Ezekiel 38. So you see how here what we're trying to put together is a whole week worth of the word and portions that we already read, not only from the instruction they are given in originally in Leviticus, but also the ones that actually cover even all the feasts that we read here in uh, Exodus 33 through 34. Now, a little bit on the Torah portion for this week, which is really tied up with the only Torah portion that usually is tied up with Simcha Torah or at the very end, and is some of the portions is read actually during that week rather than on Shabbat, like this one is. That Torah portion is Vesot HaBracha, and this is the blessing, which Kirill read some of it this morning. Okay? Most of you won't be here, and that's why uh, we did read some of that this morning. Vesot HaBracha is basically Deuteronomy Chapter 33, 1 through 34, 12. And in this particular Torah portion, it's basically Moshe recounting and blessings over the 12 tribes before he dies. Primarily, if you look through these blessings, or if you go back to Genesis 47 and 50 when Yaakov blessed his children, they're very similar. Very similar. You can find all the elements there. But in addition, Moshe... In his uh, blessing over the tribes, he basically is not as, let's say, he's not chastising them as much. He's basically not rebuking them as much. But is, is, in his uh, blessing, he not only gives the tribes some individual roles, but also roles that they do as a community together in these blessings. So if you haven't read that, you can go back over it and review it. But this is really not really the first time that Moshe had even, these are the rest of the readings for this particular Torah portion. The rest of the time, Moshe had 
already blessed the people of Israel. Actually, three times. You find it in Exodus 39, 43, after that completion of the Mishkan or the tabernacle of the wilderness. And the second time you find it in Leviticus 9, 23, at the conclusion of the first service in it. And the beginning of Deuteronomy 1, 11, which is the beginning of this book in his farewell speech. Three times he had already blessed the people of Israel together. So all of this is done prior to him rising up and going, ascending to Mount Nebo and seeing the promised land and obviously dying there. Moshe goes ahead and in this last discourse, he encourages the people down to his final moments, telling them to rely on God, to rely on God for his safety always. So it is a kind of appropriate. If you look at it, Sukkot, being under the sukkah, is even as, as temporary as it might be, is relying on a place of safety. Right? It's also called the sukkah of peace. Many of these things, you see, this is all relating. Obviously, it, we've always pointed out here the connections, messianic connections. So he encourages them, telling them to rely on Hashem. And back on Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 27, he speaks about God's greatness and as the eternal dwelling place. He is the sukkah. Okay? Rambam explains and uses this same principle and this same passage when he's talking about his principles of faith. And this is the fourth one, that Hashem... God is the eternal dwelling place. And he uses it as an irrefutable pre-existence over everything that exists. So, Hashem has no beginning and he has no end. The Torah closes in this Torah portion by saying that since the time of Moshe, there had been no prophet had risen from Israel like him. Whom the Lord knew what? Panim hapanim, face to face. But earlier in Deuteronomy 18, we read that Moshe himself announced that Hashem will raise a prophet like him among the people. Well, people say, well, is this a contradiction? Of course not. Contradictions in the Bible. No. It is not a contradiction. You find it even in Jewish writings. Messiah himself is known as the second Moses. Like Moses, Messiah himself knows Hashem and speaks to Hashem. How? Panim hapanim. Face to face. In Isaiah 63, 9 speaks about the messenger. What messenger? It's called about the malach. Sarhapanim, or the messenger of his presence, the messenger of God's face, who saves and redeems Israel since ancient times. You care to guess who that is? Of course, is known in Jewish writings as the Messiah of Israel. He, like Moses, and no one else, speaks to Hashem face to face, but unlike Moses, he pre-existed him, and unlike Moshe, and he still does today, the same Messiah. Amen? So that has to do a lot from what you see here in this Torah portion. So for those who are going to miss Monday night, now you've got a little synopsis of Vesod HaBracha in Sinka Torah. So what about Sukkot? We're still in Sukkot. Everybody agree? We're still in Sukkot? Okay, that's good. Everybody's with me. Who's ready to read? Everybody's shaking now. Sukkot is found in Leviticus <laughs> chapter 22 through 26 to 23, 44. There's the instructions to observe the appointed time. When the Monatishri, this month, the seventh month, he observes for how long? Seven days. Now, Sukkot is also part of the Shalosh Regalim, which means the, th the three biblical migratory moeds or moedims, okay? These are the fees that everyone 
needs to go up to where? To Jerusalem. Yes. Not anywhere else. Not New York. Three. Three very significant in the Bible. Look, some of the things that are connected to three. The Malachim says, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. How many times is that? doesn't say it four, doesn't say it once, it says it's three. So it has to associate it with his sanctification, okay? What else is connected with three? Every day of creation, three things were created. There's three again. There's three covenants. There's three writings. What are the writings? The Torah, the prophets, and the writings in the Tanakh. Three. There are three malachim that visit Abraham, right? There were three messengers that came to the tent of Abraham, to Abraham's sukkah. Three. His people, Israel, are made in groups of three. The Kohanim, the Leviim, and Israel. So God himself has instituted a process in which he cuts and divides and puts people. He's always done it from the beginning. Yeshua himself said that he came to what? Divide. Why? Set people apart. That means holiness. Set it unto him apart for him. Okay? So, Sukkot. All of these are tied up to the equivalent of three. You start with what feast in the spring? Pesach, seven days. Pesach is about what? Freedom from Egypt, bondage. It goes through the feast in the middle of the summer, which is the feast of what? Feast of weeks, Shavuot, in which the Matan Torah or the Torah was given. Or what was given? The guarantor, the Ruach HaKodesh, Acts chapter 2. Then it goes into what? The very end, the period you're in right now, redemption, rejoicing. See? Bookends, threes, shalosh regalim, shalosh from the number three. Now, we talked a little bit, for those who were missing the first day, about the series of names that this feast is known for. This is some of the names. The Feast of Booth, the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of the Nations. Or just the feast. You just read a portion in the Bible that says the feast. Guess what feast is that? The festival of the clouds. The feast of dedication. The festival of lights. The festival of joy. The feast of tabernacles. In other words, the festival of the great Shabbat. How many feasts are there? Seven. Shabbat. Seven. And this is the last one, right? So, in the yearly cycle, this Shabbat is Shabbat Kol Hamoe Sukkot. It's almost like the great Shabbat. It's at the end of all the feasts. And the feast really started way back when in Genesis, when it started with the first Shabbat in creation. It was set apart. Because what it means is setting apart for Hashem. Sukkot. Who goes to Sukkot? The Bible says the Gerim. For those who don't know, that comes, that's a transliteration there from the term that comes from somebody who is not a native, that lives in Israel, somebody who lives adjacent to Israel, sojourns with Israel. And all the nations are required to join Israel celebrating it. So are you exempt? Sorry. You're not. It's everybody. It says, there is a total of 70 bulls offered at this time for this feast. And 70 is connected to what? The 70 nations or the table of nations finds in Genesis 2. So, when they ask you, if you're a believer in Yeshua, the feast of the Jews 
why you do it. You don't not require to do that. You can say, well, I got news for you. It says in the Messianic kingdom to come. <laughs> if you're not doing it now, and you're in, you're going to do it then. Trust me, because it says it will withhold what? The blessings if you don't attend the feast. So it is requirement. It's a, it's a mitzvah. Okay, and traditionally, all these megilots are read during this time of these cycles, finished by Sukkot. First, in Pesach, the Song of Songs, and the Ruth and Shavuot, Lamentation in Tishbab, Esther and Purim, and Kohelet in Sukkot. Ecclesiastes, for those who don't know what Kohelet is. So Sukkot is just more than just a big celebration. It is a commandment, but it's a prophetic picture of what is to come. Okay? So we need to have that ever so present as we go through these cycles. The Messiah, Yeshua, came and completed the first portion, four of those feasts, in his first advent. But he's yet to fulfill the last three. And we are required to go up. And you see people going around with all kinds of people don't understand of paraphernalia or plants and fruits. And they wonder what is that all about? Again, this is all scriptural. It's all found in the scriptures about the four species that we see about here. They have been codified by, obviously, the Jewish uh, people, the rabbis. And it talks about it in the scriptures by name. So now you're going to learn a little bit about what is basically these four spe species that are spoken about where? Leviticus 23 Verse 40. This fruit is called a what? An etrog. It is from the family, uh, from the citrus family. Some people have some in their homes already. They've been growing it every time. Who's going to inherit this one? We don't know yet. Maybe Joanne. She likes to plant all the seeds. And may, maybe next year she'll give you some little trees. <laughs> maybe. But. It is representative, and we can go this into many different representations rabbis over the years have used and represented this fruit for, okay? But I'm just going to use a couple. They said it could represent a heart, and usually it's taken in the left hand, and the reason it's taken in the left hand is the vein that runs through here, and the middle finger out to the heart. It's taken in the heart. So it represents the heart of the Jewish So follow me on this. That's one. So if we go and we look at the rest of the element in the middle, this whole thing is called the lula, but there are different species here. In the middle, this long palm that you see here is actually the lula. Okay? This long palm. And this long palm is associated here. It's a date palm. Associated representing the spine of a man. So I started with a heart. Here's the spine of a man. Okay? But it says here, you see, it's the most prominent and it's also straight. Except this one, I put it in the refrigerator, bend it a little bit. <laughs> but it's straight. So, why is it straight? Because the way the palm tree gives it, right? But it's also significant because it represents what? Righteousness, justice, is really the Mashiach. Because one of his name is what? The branch, and the other name is what? Adonai Sikainu. Adonai of righteousness. So it's the Mashiach represented. See? But still working in a body, skeleton. A man. Okay? Started with a heart. Jewish people. As Messiah of the heart of Israel. You better believe it. 
Okay, continuing with that. <laughs> Let's look at the next element. The willow. Branch with leaves shaped like, oops, need one more. Like the mouth. His mouth are a little dry. <laughs> the willow loves water, doesn't it? And these come all the way from Israel. They've been out of water for a while. But shaped like a mouth. See here? So you see there in the example, the mouth representing, we talked with a heart, the skeleton in your mouth has to give what? The fruit of your mouth and your lips is your prayers. Right? So if from the fruit of your mouth or your prayers and the same mouth, you curse. What part of that of the lulaf will you have? See? Okay. So, next, what is the other species we have here represented? The myrtle, the das. If you look at that little leaf, that little leaf looks like an eye. Like an eye. So, it represents in a man a door of enlightenment for men. One of the worst things we can have in our lives, very difficult, is to be blind. Blind is a physical manifestation. But the blindness that this is referring to is much higher. It goes from the physical to being blind blindly spiritually. If you disconnect yourself from the Lula, if you disconnect yourself from Messiah, you become blind to the man of righteousness. All of these elements, all of these species, they come with different attributes. If you read Jewish writings, they say they can uh, attribute this to all kinds of different things which include um, male, female uh, attributes. Uh, some represent, obviously, uh, the body, as I mentioned here. Overall, even some even go as far as representing types of individuals, types of faith. Each one of them, you can find them. Overall, Sukkot and the Lulav it's basically a commandment says you could sh basically shake. But in the shaking, what do you hear? You hear the lulav. You hear the lulav, right? The palm. What happened when Messiah was coming in for the last time into Jerusalem? When hundreds and thousands of people were shaking that. Palm Sunday? That's the palm, okay? That's the palm. So what are you shaking? It says. Basically, what you're doing is what? You want this to shake on earth so you can shake heavens. You're shaking it before the Lord. Don't we shake it in every direction? You want to shake it before the Lord. You want Hashem, Messiah, to return. You want to shake in the earth so you can shake in heaven in Sukkot. It's a commandment. It's a mitzvah. And that's what we do it. So when you ask, oh, you're a believer in Yeshua, what are you shaking that stuff for? It's a commandment. Let me enlighten you. Let me help you. Let me teach you. Would you like to? Do you want to know why you shake it? This is your entry. This is your way in. There's nothing wrong that I want to do it. Then you can do a video with the, uh, with the acapella group. Hey, shake the lulav and go around the town and everybody's shaking. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> the, but you know, more, you know better. You know the representation. And you know all the feasts. And everything you do points one direction. Right here. The Messiah of Israel. The Savior of the world. So Sukkot takes a different picture now when you do this. Every month of Tishri at this time. But it's even more than that. Because 
even the representation of what this time in the future was going to bring. And now the people start getting interested. Who? We're going to get into the real stuff. We know how it's going to end. He's going to tell us how it's going to end. This is where everybody flocks and go to the latest prophecy conference so they can get the info. Last time we met, on the first day, we spoke about Zechariah 14. It's one of the Torah readings. And it's connected, obviously, to Ezekiel 38, which they read today. Uh, Joey Jr. read it today, I believe. Right? And he spoke about when he read this. And these two are obviously connected. The first day and the seventh day. These two readings. Now, just like Pesach is connected to Sukkot. So put it that way. One is in the first day, or the first feast all the way back here to the seventh. In chapter 38 of Ezekiel, if you go there, there is this significant reading, which is an important passage that people should go when they have this question. Why is it important, and why do we read it at this time? Well, I'm just going to give you a few of the words that, just to refresh your memory in case you didn't hear when he read. Because this is very important. This is the season that you're looking. So chapter 38 of the, uh, the book of Ezekiel, starting in verse 18. Actually, I started 17. It says, Thus says Adonai Elohim, are you the one that I spoke about in former times through my servants and the prophets of Israel who prophesied in those days for many years that I will bring you against them in that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel? It is a declaration of Adonai. My fury will rise up in my nostrils, in my jealousies, and the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Was there a great earthquake that we read before? Where was it? Where? Did we read Zechariah? Or we didn't read Zechariah? No, we read it in day one. <laughs> we read it in Zechariah. Yes. Now, it says, The fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep upon the ground, all humans upon their face of the earth will shake, will shake on his presence. Do you see? There'll be a shaking on earth. And there will be a shaking in heaven. When? On that day. When? At this time. In the future. Okay? So follow me. It goes on to say, The mountains will be thrown down. The steep places will fall. Every wall will fall onto the ground. And this is one of the best parts. I will call for a sword against them. Through all my mountains, it is a declaration of Adonai. And remember, every time I say Adonai, there's the four letters of his word. His name. Every time I say Adonai, it's his name. Okay? So it says, I will call for a sword for him through all my mountains. It is the declaration of Adonai. Every man's sword will be against his brother and I will punish him with the pestilence and blood and I will pour out the rain on him, on his troops and on many peoples torrential rain with hailstone, fire and brimstone who wants to see that storm? that's that's a uh, Steven Spielberg thing it's real, where do you think they got their stories from? I say, so I and not, let me jump. Let me go back. <laughs> let me not get there yet. So, if this is a prophecy regarding Israel and the siege of the nations of Jerusalem, there is two names that he read. The names of Meshach and Tubal that are listed also. You know where first? Take a guess. If there's nations, where are they listed first? Genesis chapter 2. The you find these names, Meshach and Tubal, listed there. And they are sons of Japheth. And they're part of the 70 
original family's descendants of Noah. Knowing this, you can now, in fact, correlate nations and nationalities. Even Josephus, the historian, in his volume one of Book of Antiquities, identifies Magogites as Scythians, or those people occupying southern Russia or the Caucasus near the Black and Caspian Sea. So see, this is knowledge that's been passed down. That I spoke just about the names and where they come, sons of Noah. And I'm talking now about Josephus, a historian on Roman times. That whole time, we still got a connection all the way to Gog, Magog. Outside of chapters 38 and 39, found here in the book of Ezekiel, there's really no mention of Gog and Magog in the Hebrew text of the Bible. But there is mention on other occasions on the Septuagint. Does everybody know what a Septuagint is? Yes, the Septuagint. A Septuaginta in Spanish. What is it? Yes. The translation in the Greek. This mention of this. But where? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple examples. It's found in Balaam's prophecy in Numbers chapter 24, verse 7. Interesting. Balaam's prophecy. There shall come a man out of his seat, and he shall rule over many nations in the kingdom of? Here it is. Shall be exalted, and the kingdom shall be increased. Numbers 24-7 in the Septuagint. So that tying up all the way to Noah's descendants again. And here is Balaam, who was obviously a... Prophet for hire, <laughs> saying these things. Now, where else can we find it? So we have, yeah, what we have is, is pinning, obviously, the kingdom of Messiah against the kingdom of Gog. We find it in Amos, chapter 7, verse 1, in the Septuagint. It says, the Lord God show me. And behold, a swarm of locusts coming from the east. And behold, one caterpillar. King Gog. There he is again. The second mention in the Septuagint. When the Hebrew Bible, you only find it in the book of Ezekiel. Chapters 38 and 39. So, what about? Gog is presented here in Amos as the leader of the forces that are coming against Israel in the time to come. According to some scholars and even rabbinical opinion, Gog and Magog is merely a term for any coalition force of nations that come against Israel. But in time, why? Because if you put in Hebrew the, the name Gog and Magog and you add the gematria, it's equivalent to what? 70 nations. God is perfect. 70. The 70 nations is equivalent to that. And you can find it and correlate it to obviously the table of nations. So let's read then. Somebody make a reference. Revelation. Somebody said right, right? So let's read Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. This is what people like. Yes, we're going to the end. We're going to find out how it really ends up. Well, we're almost all the way to the end here in chapter 20. Look at this. And it says that this is a period of time 
Let's just put you uh, here. This is speaking about the time after the 1,000 reign with the Mashiach. Okay? And look here at the connections. All the way back to Genesis and all the way to Revelation is connected. Okay? Regarding this topic. It says, And when 1,000 years had expired, Satan, Hasatan, shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And who's going to show up? Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle the number of whom is at the sands of the sea. Here we go again. So you got the nations and this Gog and Magog. Now this is John the Revelator. This is not Ezekiel. This is not in the Tanakh. This is in the Brit HaDashah, in the New Testament. But it perfectly correlates. See how it does? Now, so, after they, how are they going to attack Israel? I'm going to give you the key. And when? Now take notes. In the year, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, it's not. But it's very important. It is after Israel has gathered himself from the nations. Did Israel exist over 1900 years? No. It happened in 1948. Established a nation in 67. Jerusalem is part of Israel again. So you see now that that clock in Ezekiel 38 is working. Now there is Israel. Now there's a nation that nations can come against. Now, we also see that there is a certain element that is described in order for all these things to come about. They need to be gathered, but they need to be living securely in their land. The description seems to parallel the initially... Scholars will describe it two ways. They say, well, it, it, the, initially how it's described, it looks like it's already the Messianic age. The Messiah has come because there are peace in the land. But there's more than one position in this. That's why I like how God, he just teases you. Just teases you. There's some things there, but I'm not going to give you all because all you're going to do is what? Chase after that. You have to chase after me? Not after that. It says, <laughs> so it, is, it, it, it seems to parallel that because it is parallel to this time. The Feast of Ingathering. Isn't that one of the names of Sukkot? They gather the people for the four corners of the earth. Where? New York. Jerusalem. So you have it. There's an element. Already has happened. And all these things, they need to be in the land. They need to be rest, resting in the land. They need to be secure in the land. They need to be eating and drinking and being merry, happy. Right? How do I know that? We'll get there. We'll get there. But before that final battle, all of these things need to take place. Jewish sources and other commentators Go ahead and describe this battle. Also, not only being maybe in, during the Messianic Age, after the Messianic Age, but before, leading up to the Messianic Age. You see how there's more than one position there. They say that the battle after the Messianic Age has begun. It says some versions that Messiah ben Yosef. I love this one. When I read this one, I said, whoa. Messiah ben Joseph dies during the battle with Gog and Magog. Notice the name. The suffering Messiah. Has that happened? Somebody say yes. Has Messiah died? Yeah. In his first advent, he died. He also resurrected. See? In three days. Another significant of three. Three and three. It's not Chuck Woolery, two and two. It's three and three. <laughs> three days and three nights. So, 
The Midrash said, goes on to say, Ben Joseph dies in the battle of Gog and Magog. And it says, goes ahead and describes it. It said, then, at a moment when all is lost, Ben David shows up and what? Resurrects him. Wow. Defeating the armies of the invaders of Israel. Resurrecting Messiah Ben Yosef. You can find that in the Talmud, Sukkah 52. Eh? Isn't that what well, we have accepted? The, the revelation of Mashiach in his first coming. He came, Ben Yosef, died, resurrected. And now at the end, at this time, in the future, he's coming to do what? He's coming to do exactly what it says, defeat the nations that come against Israel. Just like it says here, even in Jewish writings here. Now, along those... <coughs> Gog and Magog are always going to be tied up with, like I said, coalition of forces of any kind, of nations coming against Israel. Today, everything is being made ready in Israel. Everything is aligning for the next Gog and Magog. Jews are being gathered from the four corners of the earth. They're beginning to feel even safer in the land. Of course, they got every powerful weapon to mankind, and if they don't have it, they buy it, or they develop it themselves. The Jews lead the world in surveillance. They lead the world in the discoveries. They lead the world in about every Nobel Prize you can come up with. Is that by coincidence? No. Now, let's remind you of who is orchestrating this whole thing. Back in Ezekiel 38, verse 4, it reads... And with this, you can get the children ready, please. It goes ahead. Let's start in verse 3. 3. And I say, thus says Adonai Elohim, Behold, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tuval. And here's verse 4. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws. Who's bringing them? Hashem. It's like you're fishing a hook. He said, wait, 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 wait. They're going to attack Israel. You better believe it. But who's bringing them? It says right here, he is. The Lord is bringing them. Why? Didn't I just say what was happening with his people in the land? How are they dwelling? Oh, we're in safety. Nothing is happening. Do we need Hashem? This is like us, our lives. Everything's going well. I got money. I got a job. My boy loves me. I said for a few of us. Everything's going well. So we forget about Hashem. This is what has happened in the Holy Land. His people have forgotten the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have forgotten the God of Moses. But for a few, and some of them that are basically, unlike the elements you see here, because it can have an appearance, but deep within this fruit is rotten, the heart. So now, how do we know that? So verse 4, it says, I will turn about, put hooks on your jaw, and I will bring you out with all your armies, horses, and horsemen, all of them splendidly dressed, a vast assembly, breastplate and shield, all of them wielding swords, ready for the battle. And look what I find in the Midrash. This Midrash uh, is called the Midrash Vayosha. It's a commentary. I found this in verse 164. Very interesting to read. 
And when the days of the Messiah arrive, Gog and Magog will come up against the land of Israel because they will hear that Israel is without a king. Hello. <laughs> it's not Netanyahu. And sits in safety. Instantly. Instantly, they will take with them 71 nations to go up against Jerusalem. There's, the, there's Gog and Magog. There's coming. Here it is. Well, we love it. We are getting near this next Gog and Magog battle. It seems like everything is getting ready for it. Every nation wants to gang up against Israel. And more and more resolutions by the United Nations are placed against the Jewish state. Sukkot is both an anticipation of victory over the nations by King Messiah and the Messianic age that is to come. So, we need to understand, and I like in Ezekiel 38, 23, and with this I conclude, is this verse here, this is what it's all about. I will magnify and sanctify myself. Does he need you? He chose you. He doesn't need you. He chose you. He had mercy on you. He sent his son for you. He died for you. But he doesn't need you. To magnify myself, and I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations that they will know that I am Adonai. You want to follow this? That phrase itself within those two, 38 and 39, that appears seven times. Coincidence. Seven times it says, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. It's not Lord. Ki ani you have his name. The question. And you know there's always a question. <laughs> right? There's always a question. The question is leading to this final countdown here. And the final countdown, if you all want to read, Yeshua himself, Matthew 24, can give you what the state will be when this Gog and Magog is going to show up. He gives you the description right here. If you read these passages, and you're all looking for a sign. It says, these are the birth pangs of the Messiah. Messiah is about to be what? Birth. And some people preach it, obviously, that they believe Messiah was born when? Sukkot. In a sukkah. The birth pang of the Messiah and his return also. Now, if you read that, you can go back and, re and read Matthew 24. You see that there was only one sign. Obviously, the sign in what? Noah. It was like a day of the Noah. They were <laughs> feasting and being happy and not worrying about God about anything. Getting close. And you all have one only one question. Are you ready? Because if you're not ready, you're not ready to face the Mashiach. The righteous one. Ben David. With his mouth, it says, a sword will come out. And if you keep reading here, Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's very apocalyptic. Not the prettiest thing to see. So, yes, we think and we know that God is love. But he's righteous. And when he says he's going to impart justice, it starts with his people. And continues to the nation. Amen? All right. Okay, that's Sukkot in a synopsis, Lulav, and a little bit of everything else in Haftarah. <laughs>